Hello everyone, this is Mike Dowding with the ST Minus Physics Department. Continuing with Chapter 9, the next topic in this chapter is momentum. In the previous video, we discussed center of mass, and in addition to finding the position of center of mass, how center of mass can displace velocity associated with center of mass and acceleration associated with center of mass. And the reason why we want these expressions for center of mass is so that we can take a system that has multiple particles and when I say multiple um, really what we what we intend for that to be is a system with uh, thousands if not millions of particles and obviously we're not going to have the time to sit here adding up the individual contributions of each of those particles by hand so typically what you're going to want to do is put these equations for center of mass into some kind of a simulation software um, or even Excel to keep track of what is happening in the system. And then you can run through uh, different iterations of those combinations of equations to track what is happening. But in the long run, what we want to do with these center of mass expressions is we want to take a system that has many particles and substitute that system of particles using one equivalent mass which is described using the center of mass expressions that we had in the last video. And then if we can do that we can take systems of multiple particles and we can describe things like the kinetic energy of the system by using the idea of center of mass. So the, the total kinetic energy of the system could be described as our kinetic energy expression, one half mv squared. But in this case it would be the total mass of the system which would represent that one equivalent mass traveling at the velocity that we calculated as the center of mass velocity for the system. We can also do things like work. Uh, work was force dotted with displacement. And so if we have multiple forces that are acting on multiple particles in a system, each one of those individual particles will accelerate due to Newton's second law and each of those individual particles will displace a certain displacement because of the force that is applied to them and so if we take all that information and put it together into the work expression what we have is the sum of all of the forces acting over some center of mass displacement and all we need to do is figure out what that what that uh, what that net force in the system is going to be and how it causes the center of mass to displace well that that can be pretty pretty straightforward because net force should be the sum of all the forces in the system. Yet in the previous video we just got done figuring out how to find the center of mass acceleration for a system and if we multiply that against the total mass of the system well that's the same thing as the net force of the system. So all of this is going to get substituted into the work expression which tells us that we can find the total amount of work done 
in a system if we know the information about the center of mass in the system. So that's just a, a brief review of what, what happened in that last video. And now we move on to momentum. And the idea of uh, center of mass, position, displacement, velocity, acceleration, all of that material will be revisited a little bit later in this chapter. But for right now, uh, we're going to sidestep to the definition of momentum. And if we remember back in chapter 5, we had Newton's second law that was introduced to us as F equals MA. And so if I apply a force to a mass, that mass will accelerate. But what if we were to just apply mass to velocity? In other words, what if, what if we uh, stepped down the, uh, the term of acceleration? What if, we went, what if we went backwards in that calculus process? Well, we call this combination of mass times velocity momentum. Unfortunately, we're already using the letter M for mass, and so we need a different letter for momentum. And that letter is going to be a lowercase p. And if you take a look down here, mass is a scalar, but velocity is a vector. And so just like acceleration was a vector, acceleration vector, mass, scalar, we multiply them together, we get another vector that we call force. Well, similarly, velocity is a vector, mass is a scalar, and so momentum is going to have to be a vector as well. And the direction of the momentum vector is going to have to be in the same direction as the velocity vector to maintain the equality of that expression. And that's pretty much the definition of momentum. There's not a whole lot to it. It's kind of like uh, Newton's second law, where we had F equals MA, but in this case, it's P equals MV. Now, in the last uh, couple of chapters, specifically chapters 7 and 8, we've been dealing a lot with energy and work, and both of those expressions are scalars. And so we've, we've been a little out of practice with our vector notation. So we need, we need to, to work our way back into uh, working with vectors, defining vectors. And the most important part to that is keeping in mind that we need a reference frame anytime we're dealing with vectors. And if you, if you go back to the the videos for chapter 7, chapter 8, and even a lot of the homework sets, um, you, may, you may not have realized it as we were going through there, but there, weren't, there wasn't a whole lot of need for um, a reference frame because just about everything that we were doing had to do with um, the angle relationship between things like force and displacement. And that doesn't really require a reference frame to make those measurements. It helps, but it's not, it's not necessarily needed. So now we've got momentum, mass times velocity. Well, we know firsthand that velocity can change. And so if there is a change in velocity, first rule of algebra, what we do to one side, we have to do to the other. And so that means there can be a change in momentum. We know that velocity changes because of something called acceleration. And so if we divide our delta V term by delta T, again, what we do to one side, we have to do to the other then we have effectively reproduced 
Newton's second law. And that tells us that we have a new way of describing the force in a system. It is the change in momentum with respect to the change in time. Now it is, it is important to remind ourselves here um, how, how big is delta T because delta T could be a few seconds, a few minutes, a few hours. Um, how, how big does delta T have to be before it starts becoming an issue? <clears throat> and for the students in my class, the easy way to answer that is to just say anything bigger than zero, which really doesn't leave uh, much room for anything else. But this forces us to say that the change in momentum with respect to time results in our having to measure an average force. If we want an instantaneous force value, then we have to shrink our time interval down to something instantaneous. Hence, this is where the uh, calculus will take over. And for this to work, we would have to have some kind of function for our momentum uh, with respect to time. So we would, have, we would have to have some kind of expression that we could actually manipulate with the calculus. Okay, well, this means that we can take our newfound force equation so force is the change in momentum with respect to time. And we could rearrange it to say that the change in momentum will be the result of applying a force over a measurable time interval. And so if I, if I took a force of magnitude 5 newtons and I applied it to a given mass for 10 seconds, what would be the change in momentum? Well, over here we just have the, the product of force and time. 5 times 10 is 50. And now might be a good time to discuss the units. So what are the units of momentum going to be? Well, I have newtons for force. I have seconds for time. So I guess it's a newton second. Or if we go back up to the original definition of momentum, momentum is mass times velocity. Well, mass has units of kilograms. Velocity has units of meters per second. And that, that almost looks like a Newton. If you remember, a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. We almost have that. We're just missing the extra second down in the denominator. And we can go ahead and sneak that in there as long as we sneak in an extra second in the numerator as well. And so now we do in fact have Newton seconds as the units. Um, and, th and this is the, the more preferred method of measuring um, momentum. But if you want to use kilogram meters per second, you can. Um, you're, just, you're just more likely to see it as uh, Newton seconds. Okay, so that's the change in the momentum. But I thought the momentum said something about the velocity of the object. Well, it does. Up here, this is the change in the momentum. And what this means is that, like any other delta statement, there is going to be some final minus initial combination. The final momentum 
will be the mass times the final velocity of our object. And the initial momentum will be the mass times the initial. As such, our change in momentum will be the difference in the two terms. I'm going to go ahead and factor out the mass. And what we know from our example is that by applying our 5 Newton force over a time of 10 seconds, there was a change in momentum of 50 Newton seconds, which is equal to the mass of the object times the change in velocity. So now comes the point where we need some, some uh, mass term. So we'll say the mass of this object was 2, two kilograms. All right, our 2 kilogram mass times the change in velocity equals our 50 newton seconds, or the change in velocity, delta V, has to equal 25 meters per second. So this, this uh, 2 kilogram mass, after having a force applied to it for 10 seconds, changed its velocity by 25 meters per second. Um, now that's not to say that the final velocity is 25. The difference in the two values is 25. If our mass started from rest, then we would be justified in saying that that final velocity was 25 meters per second. But maybe the mass started at an initial velocity of 10 meters per second. If that were the case, how fast would it be going after having the 5 Newton force applied to it for 10 seconds? Well, the change in the momentum is going to be exactly the same. We would have a change in velocity of 25 meters per second, as such that final velocity would then be 35 meters per second. And from there we can we can ask things like um, what were the final and initial kinetic energies, what were the changes in those energies, how much work was done. So this, this is really just a, another approach to help us set up those, those questions from, from chapter 7 and chapter 8. Now, since we're on the topic of a change in momentum, the book actually has a special name for this. Whenever we have a change in momentum, this is known as impulse. And it even has its own notation, capital J. So any change in momentum for the object is denoted as impulse. Now, the only reason I bring this up is because you may see this in one of the homework problems. If you're following along in the book, you're obviously going to see it there. Um, if, you, if you see or hear the word impulse, then you will know what it is, why it's there, but I am perfectly comfortable with just continuing to use delta P to represent a change in momentum. Okay, time for an example. Let's put all of this stuff together into a real world example. Now I, I know that we're all stuck at home in isolation right now, but if we think back to our childhood and the, the days where we go outside. Um, I'm guessing at some point we've all probably climbed a tree. Um, if you haven't, you know, get out some more. But here we've got a tree and you're going to climb that tree. And this tree has a, a branch out here 
that you're going to climb out onto. And let's say that this branch is five meters above the ground. And it's about lunchtime, so you get called into the house for lunch, and you decide it'll just be quicker if you jump out of the tree. Now, remember, you're, you're a kid. You don't really know any better. So you jump out of the tree. You've got about five meters to fall, um, which is a little, little bit over 15 feet, which is actually um, a pretty good fall. You can definitely hurt yourself. Um, maybe even worse if you land wrong. But what we want to do is figure out what is the impulse that you experience when you land and what is the average force that your body experiences from the ground in bringing you to a halt. Because when you hit the ground, when you, when you have this impact velocity, there's a, there's a very short time frame where you have to go from that impact velocity to a velocity of zero. That time interval, um, it's, it's going to be pretty short, maybe Maybe we, maybe we say about a, a tenth of a second. So up here, when we're sitting on the tree branch, we'll, we'll just kind of nudge ourselves off of the tree branch. So the initial velocity is zero meters per second. We have a displacement of five meters. And then there's going to be some impact velocity, which we want to know. But then it's this very short interval right here that we're interested in, because it's that interval along with the change in momentum that is going to tell us how much force we experience. So first things first we need the change in momentum. So final minus initial over the time interval, which is 0.1 seconds. Now, very important, this change in momentum is occurring during the impact with the ground. So we should probably be more careful in how we're how we're labeling things in the problem here. I'm going to say that v naught is the initial velocity when we jump up jump out of the tree. I'll say that v i is the impact velocity, and v final is the velocity that we have after the ground has brought us to a halt. And what we need in our change in momentum expression is our final velocity and the velocity at the initial point of impact, which would be the impact velocity. So what we really need is P final minus P at impact. And remember, both, both of these um, momentum values are going to be based on uh, the combination of your mass and your velocity at those, those given locations. Uh, your mass, given that you're, given that you're a kid, maybe, mm, I don't know, maybe 40 kilograms might be pretty reasonable for a kid. 
So we have a mass of 40 kilograms, which I will factor out of those two momentum terms. We have the difference in the velocities over 0.1 seconds. 40 kilograms, the final, final, final velocity when everything is said and done, so after the impact, is zero. And then we're subtracting whatever the velocity at impact is going to be over the time interval. So the only thing we're missing at this point is that impact velocity. And we can find that pretty easy just by going back to chapter 7 or chapter 8. We can find that impact velocity um, actually uh, about four different ways. We could use kinematics from chapter 2. We could use net force from chapter 5. We could use work from chapter 7 or we could use conservation of energy from chapter eight. So all, all four of those approaches would allow you to solve for that impact velocity. Um, since we have so many choices, I'm gonna go with the one that allows me to work with scalars, which is the chapter eight conservation of energy approach. I can, I can compare the energy at two locations. So the, the initial total energy versus the total energy at impact. And the only thing that I have to do is um, decide where in my diagram I want the gravity potential to be zero. And I'll just go ahead and let that be at ground level. So now, our initial kinetic energy, so the kinetic energy at the initial point is zero because our initial velocity was zero. Our initial gravity potential is mgh naught, where h naught is measured from the zero point, but that's just the displacement d or the five meters that we dropped. Then we get down to the ground where we impact, and this is not zero. Okay, we're, we're impacting. We're not, we're not coming to a stop just yet. But because we are at the ground, the potential energy at the ground and that was the zero point in our system, so we can let that be zero. In this case, the mass of the child is not required. It factors out. And we're, we're assuming um, no air resistance in this case. But rearranging to solve for the impact velocity, we get square root of 2GD. And now we can get our calculator out and plug in the values. 2, 9.8, and 5. We need to square root that, which is 9.9 .9 meters per second. So almost 10 meters per second is how fast you're traveling when you finally impact the ground. So 40, 0 minus, and if you don't mind, I'm just going to round this up to 10. All over 0.1. Now, we're going to get a minus sign out of this. And what does that mean? Well, remember that we are solving for a force. And this whole time, you have been traveling down to the ground 
and we need the ground to stop us. And so how is the ground going to stop us and slow us down? Well, the ground is going to have to push in the opposite direction. So that's what that, that minus sign is there for. All that's saying is that the force has to be in the opposite direction of what our uh, initial velocity was. Okay, so 40 times negative 10 is negative 400 divided by 0.1 will give us negative 4,000. Negative 4,000 what? Well, we're uh, solving for a, a force here, so that's going to be negative 4,000 newtons. Now, uh, direction aside, uh, we know that minus sign is there just to tell us that our, our force has to be opposite the direction that we were initially traveling. Um, if we wanted to, we could say that the reference frame of the system was initially positive down, and then that that uh, makes our our average force. It makes the sign on that average force make more sense. Uh, but at this point, now I'm just more concerned about the the magnitude of that force. We have four thousand newtons worth of force acting on this child. If we take that force and we divide it by the weight of the child. So we've got 4,000 newtons divided by the weight of the child, which is approximately 400 newtons. So 40 times uh, 9.8. It's a um, little bit, little bit less than 400. Um, yeah, we'll just we'll go with this. So the the average force that this child is experiencing during the landing is approximately 10 times their own weight. So if you can imagine, even even for just a a tenth of a second having to support 10 times your own weight. That is what it feels like when you hit the ground. And I don't know about you, but I probably couldn't support 10 times my own weight. And I'm, guess, I'm guessing even a child couldn't either. And one mistake that a lot of people make when they they fall large distances is um, they might lock up their knees and when that happens they end up doing a lot of damage because their their legs can't support that much force even though it's over a very short time frame um, so this this child could very well end up um, spraining their ankle breaking their ankle uh, breaking their leg um, all be all because um, they they hit the ground too hard, and so this this poor kid ends up you know in the hospital with a broken leg or something, and while they're recuperating, somebody brings them a physics book to read because they got the time, and this kid gets to the chapter on momentum. And they see this equation that says that the average force is a result of the change in momentum with respect to a change in time. Now, jumping out of that tree, there's, there's really nothing that we can do to change um, the there's nothing we can do to affect the change in momentum. Um, in other words, every time we jump out of this tree and fall five meters, that final 
velocity is always going to be roughly 10 meters per second. So that, that delta P part, that we can't change. But maybe we could do something about that time of impact. Remember we said that this kid probably made the mistake of uh, locking their knees up when they landed and that meant that they they had to come to a stop in a very short amount of time. Um, but if you've if you've ever uh, read up on any safety, um, if you fall, what are you supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to go limp, you're supposed to roll, you're supposed to let your body crumple and what that does is it allows you to extend the time interval it allows you to increase the amount of time required to change your momentum and if we can increase that time interval um, if we divide by a larger value then we can actually reduce the average force that we are exposed to. So instead of jumping out of this tree and locking up our knees, maybe we bend our knees and we allow our body to crumple and as we as we impact the ground we roll. And what all of this is going to do is it's going to increase the time required to bring us to that final velocity of zero. So maybe in, in doing that, maybe as we allow our body to crumple, we increase the time to a half a second. And I, I realize that may not seem like much, going from a tenth of a second to a half of a second, but in terms of the, multipl the multiplication, that's a factor of five. So what's going to happen if we have our original average force of 4,000 newtons, which was the result of our change in momentum over the change in time, but we increase the time interval to 0.5. Well, that's going to take our uh, 4,000 newtons of average force and it's going to shrink it down to 800. So now we have an average force of 800 newtons acting on this child as they land. And this is only about two times their own weight. So by, by bending our knees, crumpling our body, rolling, whatever we have to do to extend that time frame, uh, we've now decreased the average force so that we're only feeling about twice as heavy as we usually do. And still, you, you, you might injure yourself, but... Um, at the very least, I would say you would just have a, a, a slightly uncomfortable landing as opposed to uh, seriously injuring yourself and possibly breaking a bone. Well, I don't uh, recommend going out and, and trying this by jumping out of a tree. Um, some of us watching at home I have no doubt jumped out of trees or maybe even fallen out of a tree and so you you uh, you know the idea behind impulse and change in momentum all too well but we can take this idea and we can apply it to other areas to help save lives and one of those areas is in the automotive industry um, you're starting to see more and more cars that are being designed to crumple and 
ba basically um, total themselves out, um, even with um, minor minor collisions. Um, so let's say you have a car that is traveling along with some initial velocity, maybe 20 meters per second. And the driver loses control and ends up uh, crashing into a wall. And during that crash, there is a time interval of about, we'll say, uh, 1 one hundredth of a second. And if you were to calculate the average amount of force that a person would experience during a collision like this. Um, we're going from 20 meters per second to a final velocity of zero within uh, really just a, a blink of an eye. And so the average person, which I'll go ahead and say about 100 kilograms, it's probably a a little bit more than the average person, but just for the sake of this discussion, we've got 100 kilograms. The change in velocity is 0 minus 20. And so again, that negative sign comes from the fact that the average velocity is going to oppose the original direction. And then we've got our time frame of 0.01. And this is resulting in about 200,000 newtons of force acting on the, uh, the occupant of this vehicle, which is probably the driver. And so that person is effectively experiencing roughly... Um, a thousand times their own weight in stopping force. And that is enough to kill a person quite easily. And so how do we help save the life of the occupant of this of this car, whether it's whether it's the driver or the passenger? Well, the uh, the first, method that was um, applied in situations like this. Um, if, you, if you look back to the earliest cars that were made, um, especially getting into like the 50s and 60s and 70s, these, these cars were made of very heavy, very sturdy metal. Um, you, you could crash some of these things into a brick wall and the, the car itself would would not have much of a dent in it whatsoever. Um, but that means that all of the force required for stopping would essentially be in the person. And you get a lot of people that would not survive those kinds of crashes. And so they started to um, employ airbags into these cars. And the airbag would, um, there would, there would be some sensors in the vehicle, usually in the front and the back bumper. And if those sensors were triggered by a collision, then the airbag would inflate. It would inflate very, very quickly. But as the vehicle comes to a stop, keep in mind that the vehicle itself was still going to come to the same change in momentum. And that means that the occupant of the vehicle also has to uh, experience the same change in momentum. So we, we can't change that. But we can change the amount of time that is required for the occupant to come to a stop. And by having this airbag here, the airbag provides a cushioning effect, which 
slows the occupant down over a larger time frame. And this airbag may very well be able to take this time interval and increase it to something like a tenth of a second as opposed to one one hundredth of a second. And that would reduce the overall force from a thousand times their weight to a hundred times their weight. Now even still this is this is probably enough to really hurt a person but not nearly so much as this. This this could mean the difference between life and death for the occupant of the vehicle. Um, this, this could also um, mean the difference between the occupant being able to walk away from the, the crash or having to be carried away on a stretcher. And these, these airbags were very, very successful in saving lives. And since then, um, it seems like every new model of car that comes out has more and more airbags available. Um, you now you now have uh, airbags that are essentially hidden in just about uh, every every corner of the vehicle um, for side collisions, front collisions, you name it. But every time one of these airbags goes off, you have to have them replaced and. Um, my my father had a a truck where just a tiny little fender bender, but it was enough to set off the airbag, and it was about five hundred dollars to have it reset. So it's it's not very pricey, but or excuse me, it is very pricey, um, but it would definitely be worth it if it means uh, you can walk away from a crash versus having to stay in a hospital uh, for recovery time. Uh, so if you if you do find yourself buying a used vehicle, uh, make sure that you you know whether or not the the airbags are still um, valid or if they've been deployed or reset, because um, that's that's your life that you're talking about there. And then um, another thing that automotive companies have done in addition to the airbags is they design what are known as crumple zones within the vehicle. So these are areas of the vehicle that are literally designed to cave in during a collision. And when that happens, yes, the vehicle is totaled, um, but that's kind of the idea. The, the vehicle takes the brunt of the collision and as the vehicle itself is collapsing, it extends the time interval, delta T, to help save the life of the occupant in addition to um, having an airbag to cushion. Because uh, if, it, if it's the difference between uh, you slamming into a inflatable pillow or the steering wheel um, neither of them is going to to feel very good but um, the the airbag itself is going to save your life and then uh, surprisingly you see a lot of people that are really really mad about their vehicle being totaled but it's just a vehicle you can always get another vehicle you, you can't get another you So this is going to conclude the video for momentum. We're going to continue with the topic. Um, the next video we're going to look at uh, collisions and actually work through a couple of examples of collisions because just like conservation of energy we are also going to have what is called the conservation of momentum. And this, this is going to be important for uh, cases where you have two or more masses that interact with one another. And a, a good example for this would be something like billiards or pool. So next video, we'll play some billiards. And we'll talk about the conservation of momentum.
So, see you then.